Hello, everyone. This is another episode of the Unisoft Question, a YouTube show and podcast about lawyers. And uh, today I have a lawyer on the show, a really interesting one at that. So this lawyer started her own practice in the COVID year. Without further ado, Erin O'Rourke. How are you, Erin, today? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me on here to talk about my experiences. I'm really excited. Yes, it's a great pleasure to have you. Uh, just as I said before we started the recording, I also started my own practice uh, only uh, quite a few years ago, and I'm always interested in people who do this. And, you know, of all years, you did, you did this in the COVID year, right? You did this in the COVID right. year. So you graduated from um, law school uh, last year, correct? In 2019. So, okay, almost two years ago. And you went to Windsor, yeah. correct? Yes, I did. You know what really interested me in your uh, background, your high school? <laughs> isn't, this, isn't this the favorite subject of everyone? Isn't this the most productive time in someone's life, high school, the high school years? So yeah. I'm looking at your high school um, uh, record. And yeah. this, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, hack into the Ontario <laughs> uh, school system or anything. It's on LinkedIn. So here's a list of activities and societies that you participated in, in uh, at Ridley College, which was your high school, I assume. Yeah. Uh, prefect. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Mind so it's kind of like our student government. Uh -huh. Instead okay. of having a student government, we have prefects. It's kind of like Hogwarts. Okay. <laughs> But okay, sure, that's really cool. But that's only number one of many, many more to come. So debate team, I understand that. Editor mm -hmm. of Tiger Tribune, which I assume was the student newspaper. Yeah. Was it printed or was it fully online, by the way? Printed. We had an on, I think we had an online version, but uh, we also printed it. Okay. Duke of Edinburgh, gold level participant. What is that? Yeah, so that's a program that I participated in and you have to do a certain amount of service hours mm -hmm. per year and you mm -hmm. have to go on expeditions as well. So I actually got to go dog sledding in high school in Algonquin and I also was supposed to go ski touring, which is when you have one dog and a sled, but um, or on skis, one dog in a, and you're on skis, but there wasn't enough snow that weekend. So we ended up just going hiking, but had lots of really great experiences through that program. Amazing. My high school was <laughs> nothing like that. <laughs> Battalion uh, adjutant. I don't know if I'm pronouncing adjutant correctly. I don't, yeah. I don't usually use that word very much in my law practice or life. What is that? Does something to do so, with, with the military? Yeah, so we have a cadet program at my high school. And so I was the battalion adjutant, which um, was sort of in charge of keeping everything running with attendance and making sure everyone had what they needed, kind of like the behind the scenes mm -hmm. um, person. And the big thing was we have cadet ball at our high school. We didn't have prom, so it was called cadet ball. So <laughs> I, I would organize and run that. Wow. Have you served in the military? No, no military experience. No military experience. Uh, first team field hockey and soccer player. Why, why, first of all, I know what field hockey is. Yeah. And I know how, diff how, how it's different from ice hockey. And I know what <laughs> soccer is. But what does, it mean, what does it mean when you say first team player? Right. So in our school... Um, we were part of the CASE system, uh, so the Canadian Association of Independent Schools. And so they have first team is like the best team. <laughs> and then you would have second team. It's just a tier under that. And then you might have like a U16 team for younger players. So I was on the, the first team for field hockey and soccer. And then I actually went on to play field hockey at McGill too. For our listeners and viewers, you know, the list goes on and on. I'm not done here. <laughs> so the next item on the list, choir. Are you a good singer? Yeah. No, definitely not a good singer. I, I think I just did that to hang out with my friends, <laughs> to be honest. 
<laughs> my sister is the singer. I am not the singer. <laughs> okay, so the next uh, item, dance team member. You like dancing? Yes, yes. I used to dance. Um, I did Irish dancing when I was little, and then I did tap, jazz, lyrical, and ballet. And mm -hmm. then in high school, I had to sort of let go of my private dancing classes because I had a lot of other things on the go. So I was on the dance team at Ridley and we did uh, different musicals. So we did cabaret and hairspray when I was there. So I was wow. a, the dancer in those two. And the final number musicals yeah that's related to singing right yeah exactly so. okay so my, the question my question is what career were you preparing yourself for in high school <laughs> were you going to be like a double uh, 07 or like an international woman of mystery or you know uh, something i don't know it's it's so wide and broad and uh and uh, interesting i've never really seen such a diversity of interests in high school <laughs> yeah i did have a, a diverse set of interests actually my dream job when i was going through high school was to become an ambassador <laughs> that was wow. i thought that would be the coolest thing and actually on one of my trips for debating um, at the international uh, debating competition it was held in ottawa that year and they used to do homestays, so you would stay with local families um, during the competition. And I actually ended up staying with the um, ambassador from Holland to Canada's house, which was so neat. It was the coolest experience, uh, just getting to sit there and, and talk to them about their experiences, which was super cool. Um, but slowly, I kind of, so that's kind of why I went into international relations, international development. And then I guess my interest kind of shifted away from wanting to be uh, working within the government system to having a bit more uh, free thought and, and mm -hmm. being able to, to have my own opinions rather than just uh, being the ambassador for the country's opinion. Right. So you prefer uh, to be your own spokesperson rather than the government's spokesperson? Yeah. Yeah, and, exactly. and before we before we talk about international relations, which is a really interesting subject to me, I want to ask you where Ridley College actually is located. Yeah, so it's located in St. Catharines, Ontario. And the reason I went there was because my mom and dad taught there. My dad still teaches there. Um, and we actually were the house masters. Well, I wasn't. My parents were the house masters. This totally sounds um, like Harry Potter at this point. Yeah, it does. It does. So they were the house masters and we lived in a house that was attached from our living room. There was a door that opened to all the, the middle schoolers. And so my parents looked after the grades five to eight. And so that was, I lived on campus until I was 12. And then we moved off campus, but I kept going to school there. And my dad still teaches there and uh, works in the middle school. So I'm still kind of connected to the school, but it was a really neat and unique experience for sure. You had the coolest childhood. Are you originally <laughs> yeah. from St. Catharines? Yeah, yeah. I okay. was born, born and raised in St. Catharines. Yeah, I've been there a few times. My friend used to live there. Yeah, it's a nice city. I like it. Yep. Cheap real estate. That's all Toronto people. Toronto people are interested in, by the way. Yeah, cheap, it's, cheap it's real getting estate. up there. It's trickling down a little bit down the highway. Oh yeah. It's starting oh, to feel okay. the prices go up a bit, but definitely nowhere close to Toronto market. <laughs> so, with your dream of becoming an ambassador, you you went into an international relations program at McGill, which is a fantastic international relations program and a fantastic university. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think this is something that you and I have in common. I had my undergrad was in international relations. Oh, nice. And I also got a, a postgraduate degree in international relations. So I'm overschooled. <laughs> was the, your uh, undergraduate program everything you thought it would be? Because you never became an ambassador. Let's just jump to, yeah, that's true. <laughs> to, to, the, to the end here. So what happened? Yeah. I guess my opinion sort of changed as I was going through um, my uh, degree. 
I guess I will caveat that and say I wanted to be an ambassador or work for the UN. That was like my dream job was working for the UN. Um, and so going through the program, just learning more, um, just my opinions changed, I guess. And I was actually considering doing a master's or doing more studies in the area. And I was at that classic decision of law school or more uh, master's research. And I ended up actually deciding to do law school instead. Mm -hmm. Is law school a natural uh, next step after the international relations program? You're not the only person on this show, yeah. by the way, who did this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't know if it's the natural next step. Um, I am definitely probably leaning towards kind of continuing my research. And I thought that it would be really interesting to, to do some more research, but I actually ended up talking to one of my professors who I really admired and we had a very interesting conversation about what that would mean and uh, what kind of career opportunities there would be after a master's versus what kind of career opportunities there would be after law school. So I decided to, um, to continue with uh, the law school path. Describe your interest in international relations during your undergraduate program. Was it, uh, did you have a particular focus? I see that you um, mentioned four languages on LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, uh, I'm not teasing you, but uh, I have an analogy here. So the thing about me is I have yeah. a lot of books at home. And mm -hmm. uh, if you ask me about almost any book, I will say, oh yeah, I started reading that book. <laughs> so I start reading a lot of books, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah. I, I actually have the same thing about languages too. So I, I like dabbling in languages. So tell yeah. me about your interest in languages. Is it because of your international relations uh, program or is it something else? Arabic, French, Spanish, very interesting. Yeah, so um, at Ridley, I took French and Spanish. And in grade 10, I actually lived in Spain for three months with a wow. host family. And I would say I was almost pretty fluent in Spanish at that point. And I'd say pretty comfortable in French as well. Um, and I believe I took advanced uh, French and Spanish when I was in high school and, and did pretty well in languages then. Um, I slowly started to lose my Spanish a little bit um, because I haven't been practicing it. But in uh, Montreal, when I was at McGill, I did continue to take French. Now that's also kind of slipping a bit too because I haven't kept up those two languages. Um, when I was in third year of undergrad, I studied abroad in Israel for four and a half months. Um, I was another one of my uh, areas of study was Middle East. And so I studied abroad at Tel Aviv and really got to get a deeper dive into the conflict there and, and learn more um, about that history. And so when I was there, I also took Hebrew and Arabic, but I wouldn't say I have retained much of that. I could describe an apartment in, <laughs> in one of those languages, maybe, but that's about it now. Well, uh, I would say using my book analogy, you didn't just start those books. You're way uh, <laughs> on your way to uh, past, past the midpoint, I would say, because if you were ever proficient in Spanish, in, in, in my experience, I speak several languages, yeah. right? And I wasn't even born in Canada. So my first language isn't even English. In my experience, right. uh, elementary proficiency, which is what you said about your, your command of Spanish, on LinkedIn, it's 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 when I watch a few Polish videos on YouTube, and then you know uh, a couple of hours later, I have elementary proficiency in Polish, right? right so right. this is definitely not elementary proficiency what you just described. So to me, it's it sounds more like intermediate at, at least. And also in my experience, yeah, um, even when when you lose some language command or or skills, they come back so fast once you start practicing. So no one is even going to notice that yeah <laughs> that you lost some you you're going to gain it back so quickly so um yeah all right, i hope that's... so <laughs>
That's really great. Not a lot of people in North America speak so many languages. I'm, I, I really admire uh, it when people speak so many languages and also are, are well traveled and not even mm-hmm. in, uh, you know, the most, the easiest parts of the world as well. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So, but law school is nothing like an international relations program. Right. <laughs> Were you shocked or was it a comfortable ride at Windsor? Yeah, so when I was deciding to go to law school, I didn't think I was going to be a lawyer. I didn't think I was going to write the bar exam. I thought, okay, I have studied problems with international relations and international development for the last four years. Let's find some solutions. And so I really thought that I would go to law school and I would figure out all of the solutions and and find the tools and all the the right answers would be there. And so I was hoping I could use those tools and then hopefully have like an international career. But when I got to law school, I really started to um, build an interest in employment law and uh, immigration law and, and different areas that are more uh, domestic. And I slowly uh, kind of shifted away from wanting an international career to wanting to, to do stuff in the community. You graduated uh, in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right, yeah. And when you graduated, of course, you didn't know that we're going to have a pandemic the following year, right? Right. Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what went through your mind as you were graduating? What were you What were your plans? What was your What were your expectations as a law school graduate? So, you were. Yeah. I, where did you finally decide to write a bar exam? Right. Were you going to do the articling? What was the strategy there? Yeah. So the previous summer, I had done my two L recruit. So I already knew from May or June 2018 that I was going to have articling. Uh, I had decided on articling at Simpson Weigel in Hamilton. It's an all service firm. And I really enjoyed my interviews with them and really uh, enjoyed the process. So I was very much looking forward to doing articling. I had at that point decided that I was interested in practicing Uh, employment and uh, immigration. And so I was signed up to write the bar exam. I graduated, wrote the bar exam. And then I um, started the first 10 months or so uh, in the traditional articling position. And then when COVID hit, we had about two and a half months left of articling. And it was kind of crazy at that point no one knew what was happening. All of our friends were kind of messaging each other saying like, is there any way we can lose our articling position? Are we going to get called to the bar on time? What's happening with the call to the bar? It was kind of a, a moment of a lot of anxiety because no one knew what was going to happen. Um, I'm very fortunate that my law firm was able to let us finish articling and, and really um, let us continue right on track. So that was really um, helpful and, and helped us keep on track. But again, unfortunately, just because of the uncertainty at the time, that that was only two months into the pandemic, no one knew how long this was going to last. No one, I did not expect it to last until now. I was still in a little bit of denial. (laughs) So uh, there wasn't any higher back opportunities at that time. And I know a lot of other friends at different firms were facing similar situations. You know, you're not the only one. I remember telling my friends in uh, March that this was going to be over by end of April last year. (laughs) I was so sure, you know, I thought, how can it be? I mean, it's not fair to me that, you know, um, it's never happened in a hundred years and why does it have to happen during my lifetime, right? So (laughs) it's like, it's so unfair and I'm so important, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, the, 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 and of course I was wrong. And um, I, I think a lot of people were wrong. But yeah. you didn't just recover from the, uh, uh, this common failure to predict the future. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. also 
started your own practice. So what happened there? Tell us the story. Yeah, so that wasn't something I was really considering. I believe it was, um, I think two days, two days before the, what I call the world shut down. Uh, I remember it as Rudy Gobert touching all the microphones and then the world shut down. That's how I will remember it. Um, but I believe it was two days before that I was out for lunch with one of the partners at the firm and we were discussing future opportunities and then the world shut down and everything changed, right? So I wasn't thinking about going out on my own. Uh, that wasn't really on my radar. But as I was starting to look up positions available, it was pretty sparse at the time. And I knew I had student debt to pay and that my bills would keep coming. And I know that CERB was available, but um, it was a pretty small amount to survive on for sure. So I looked into, okay, how much would my bar fees cost if I just cover it for a little while? And I just do some advice here and there. And then as I did more and more research into that, I realized that it wasn't as crazy as I thought it would be to start my own firm and decided to just go for it. I'm looking at your firm's website right now. <laughs> it's, yeah. to the right, it's to the right of the camera, so I'm going to turn my head. And uh, I'm really impressed with your website. So oh, I started you. my own. Well, it's true. And let me tell you, I'm, I know what I'm talking about because I've had my own practice for almost 10 years and I went through several iterations of my website. I'm also a former uh, computer programmer before law school, right? So I'm really technically uh, skilled. I did my own mm -hmm. website myself, but I'm also interested in marketing. So I'm telling you this quite frankly, and I think with uh, the appropriate gravitas, I think your website is great. Thank you. But what I'm interested in, so when I started my, web, uh, my, my law firm, my, my own practice in 2011, my website was, very, was terrible. I just <laughs> quickly put it together and I didn't really know much about calls to action, you know, all these buttons mm -hmm. that let you call and buttons that uh, let you submit a, a form uh, because that would uh, uh, signify a, a conversion using the marketing speak right and maybe also mm -hmm. some google ads are running i don't know so it's obvious that you uh, have some marketing you put some marketing thought in your website so tell me how you did this, uh, you started your practice only a few months ago. Right. And you said that you didn't expect to start your own practice. You didn't <laughs> plan for it. Yet we have a really good professional looking website that obviously was done with marketing in, in mind. Tell me mm -hmm. the story. Yeah, so as I was sort of starting to think about doing this. Um, my uncle is my financial advisor. And so I called him and we sort of talked through the numbers and, and figured out how we would do that. But he's also been a serial entrepreneur himself. And, and so he was pretty much my advisor throughout everything. And just so happened that he is great at making websites and helping me through that. So while I did a lot of the work on the website, I would call him up often at 11 p.m. saying, help, <laughs> I've lost something, please help me. Um, and he would, would be there to help me through fixing any problems um, and would kind of suggest, you know, he's the one who had the idea for the call button and, and sort of talking me through that. So um, I have to give a lot of credit to my uncle who helped me through that. My cousin, his daughter, also designed my logo. So one night I was just kind of talking to her and I said, oh, I'm thinking about starting my own law firm. And she just sketched something up and showed it to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, that looks so cool. And then she built it out for me and uh, sent me all the colors so that I could incorporate those same brand colors throughout the website and on my social media. And so I don't have any formal marketing training. I just kind of looked online to see what other firms are doing. 
looked at different blogs on how to build uh, websites and really just tried to figure it out as I went and it became almost an obsession. So after dinner, I'd go upstairs, figure out what I was doing that night and on the weekend, um, just chipping away and building at it. But it was such a fun part of the process. I really enjoy those uh, memories of, of getting everything off the ground. Yes, and uh, you did an amazing job. Oh, thank you. I'm looking at your website and I want to talk a little bit about your services, the services that your law firm provides. First of all, I understand uh, you haven't incorporated. You're um, acting in your own personal capacity, right? Correct. Okay. So uh, I'm looking at the list of services and uh, it includes employment, immigration, litigation, tenancies, legal coaching, and notary pu uh, public. So. Mm -hmm. What is the split between litigation and non-litigation work in your practice? Yeah, so I would say the majority of my files are employment related and some of them overlap between employment and immigration. And I would say about 25-30% of those files are active litigation files right now. Um, and a lot of those in the employment context. Um, I do have some active commercial um, litigation files as well. And um, I'm really enjoying the wide range of different uh, areas that I'm, I'm practicing right now. But each practice area was picked specifically either because I have a passion or knowledge of that subject area. Um, so, for example, someone came to me with a real estate transaction, I'm happy to refer them out, but that's not something I know how to do, and I don't want to spend the time learning how to do that. I'd rather hone the skills that I have in, in the areas of practice that I enjoy. When you say that um, litigation is a fraction of your practice, do I understand it correctly that you do... Uh, employment litigation, but you also do employment advisory work or drafting uh, or, or similar employment work that is not litigation related, correct? Correct, yeah. So if someone's starting a position and needs a contract reviewed or they're considering leaving a position, they need to review their competition clause, non-competition clause, or if on the other side, um, on the employer side, dealing with terminations properly, hiring contracts, independent contracts, all that sort of stuff. So it's uh, kind of split down the middle and that's kind of what attracted me to employment law is you kind of get both sides of the spectrum there. In your experience, which I know is limited to several months at this point, what is the right. fastest growing uh, area of practice uh, for you? For me, it would be employment law. Um, I do get a lot of phone calls for tenancy issues, especially right now with COVID, um, but those tend to be sort of one-off questions. Um, a lot of employment work is coming in right now, again, I think because of COVID and a lot of employers and employees are a bit concerned about what their rights and responsibilities are at this time. So I'm, I'm definitely finding that to be a large portion of my practice. Explain what legal coaching means. And right. yeah, why, why? I've never seen that as an area of practice on any lawyer's website. So let's talk about that a little. <laughs> yeah, so in law school, um, there's the National Self-Represented Litigants Program. And that's run by Julie McFarland out of Windsor Law. And so that was very much top of mind when we were at law school was learning about the access to justice gaps um, and, and acknowledging that there's a lot of people who need legal services but can't afford full retainers. So the legal coaching is for people who can't afford to retain uh, a lawyer for the full trial, but maybe want to uh, kind of do unbundled services for certain portions of the of the process so for example i can help with drafting the claim and then maybe they want to do negotiations on their own or 
I can step in at a certain point of the litigation when they need help, but they do the beginning parts on their own, sort of to make it a bit more affordable and um, assist them through the legal process. I know that you practice law in Hamilton, or rather you had an articling job in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. So Hamilton is uh, much bigger than St. Catharines. Yeah. Uh, St. Catharines is a fairly small town. What is it like to start uh, a practice in a s really small town and to practice law in a small town? Yeah, I really enjoy getting to serve clients in my uh, home community again. Um, it's really interesting to be able to come back after so many years away at school and be able to, to bring my skills and services to the local community. I think that now with COVID, it's made virtual services a lot easier. So while I do um, assist a lot of people in St. Catharines, it's expanded to other regions as well. So I can easily hop on a call with someone from Hamilton or Toronto or elsewhere in Ontario um, and assist them virtually over Zoom or a phone call. So it's interesting to be practicing in a small town right now because it's not the traditional brick and mortar setup where I'm just serving clients in that uh, vicinity. Um, the virtual option really broadens the horizon there. Knowing what we know about changes that took place in our core system since last summer, mm -hmm. and those changes were, I think, nothing short of revolutionary. Right. Uh, in, in my long, fairly long experience, I didn't expect this to happen for another 10 years. <laughs> so, so the bottom line is you don't need to go to the courthouse anymore. Right. right? The bottom line is you don't even need to send anyone to the courthouse anymore. Right. That's, that's two. Three, you don't need to see clients in person anymore. One of the mm -hmm. big reasons to see clients before was to commission affidavits. Not right. necessary anymore to do it in person. Right. Uh, so knowing all of this and knowing that it doesn't matter where you are right now for your practice of law, you might as well be on a beach in Florida. Well, don't, right? Not right now. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Yeah. What is stopping you with your much smaller cost base compared to Toronto? Mm -hmm. I'm making an assumption here. I think it's, it's a sound assumption. Mm -hmm. What is stopping you from competing with Toronto employment lawyers? Right. If, if anything. And mm -hmm. why even... You're not, you know, to me, you're not a St. Catherine's lawyer. To me, this concept of uh, a town lawyer or a locale lawyer, St. Catherine's lawyer, Hamilton lawyer, it's on the way out. Yeah, I agree. So, so what is stopping you today from competing with Toronto employment lawyers, which who probably charge more than you? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think that I see that also happening. Um, sometimes I see people wanting people to be lawyers to be from their area. Um, sometimes when I'm, I'm in a bunch of different groups that, that sort of send referrals out and often sometimes lawyers will ask, oh, well, where are, where's the client, where are they? But I think that that's kind of, as you said, becoming a way of the past now that, that there's really no need to meet people in person. And I think I've found that my clients are really enjoying that as well. I had a client who called me and she said, this is great. I'm meeting with my lawyer in my leggings and I'm just sitting at home. You know what I mean? She was loving it. She's like, I don't have to get dressed up. I don't have to find parking. I don't have to come and take a big chunk of my day. I can just call and it's done. So I think that, um, that sort of locale um, is going to change. But I think for now, as I'm sort of building up my reputation, I'm kind of trying to focus on becoming known in my area um, for employment and immigration law. 
and sort of as I build up that reputa reputation, be able to compete more with the, with the Toronto lawyers. But again, it may have lower costs, but they also have um, established brands and um, clientele already. So well, I guess we'll see well, how that goes. <laughs> that's, that's right. But I'm not suggesting competing with lawyers from a different category. Right? There is a hierarchy right. of, of lawyers and hierarchies right. are not always bad. Sometimes they stand for quality or, or experience mm -hmm. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm talking about competing with Toronto lawyers from the same category as you, right? So recent calls, right. more junior lawyers. Also in this in this regard, but you know what? I think nothing should stop you from competing with anyone, by the way, even with the, with the highest, with the lawyers with the highest uh, le levels of experience, because sometimes uh, files uh, are, are, are more fit for someone with, with a uh, fewer years of experience because of, okay. of the cost factor, right? So, mm -hmm. but here's a question for you. Because of the technology, you don't have to, uh, you're not tied to a particular location anymore uh, when you see clients or when you file in court or right. when you serve other lawyers, location doesn't matter anymore. Everything is electronic. But it also means that other lawyers can farm work out to you right. very easily now, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. and, and um, I think it, it could make business sense for, let's say, lawyers in uh, several tiers higher than you are in experience to consider uh, shipping work off to to you like it could be the offshore um, uh, lawyer mm -hmm. or for Toronto lawyers where where costs are very high have you considered something like that and do you have any experience with this tell us yeah so I have done some work like that for more senior lawyers in Toronto which has been a great experience because not only do I get to learn from the lawyer, they also um, just pay me a fraction of the fee of what it would cost them to, to bill out to the client. So it's a great learning opportunity for me too. And the lawyers that I've worked with have been so great at giving me feedback and uh, walking me through the process so that I'm able to help my clients further down the line and uh, be able to provide solid work for those lawyers as well. So I definitely see that as a, a great opportunity, especially for new lawyers, because we don't have that built-in mentorship and the built-in seniority that the traditional law firm has. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Or does it make absolutely zero sense to ask a question like that in the COVID year? I know. I. I am one who loves my planner and I love looking forward and I usually have things planned out so far in advance. Um, and when COVID hit, all those plans sort of just kept coming off the, the calendar and it was kind of scary to see all this structure that I had built up kind of disappear. So um, I usually would say, okay, I have a five-year plan. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to be like. But I'm also learning to be a bit more flexible with that, especially with COVID and, and you never really know how things are gonna play out. But in the future, I would love to kind of grow my practice a little bit more to have some support because right now it's just me doing everything, which I really enjoy right now, but I'm sure the glimmer of it will fade <laughs> in a little while after, after the novelty wears off. But I would love to be able to bring on articling students in the future, especially articling students who are considering going out on their own. I think that would be a really neat experience uh, to be able to train future lawyers. So that's something that I'm definitely looking forward to down the line. Yeah, nobody likes filling out those form nine A's. Just <laughs> yeah, to, no. <laughs> to transfer $100 from the trust account to the general account, you have to put three signatures there and they're all going to be yours because you're the only person. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, guarding the fort. 
Look, it's been a true pleasure talking to you, Aaron. I really enjoyed it. Um, I am inspired by you and you oh, sort you. of rekindled this uh, passion and romance of starting things up that I remember mm -hmm. vaguely <laughs> from 10 <laughs> years ago. I really appreciate it. And it's even more uh, inspiring because you did all of this in uh, at the time that is much, much harder in a sense because of the pandemic. But in a sense, I mean, I wish we had electronic filing right in 2011. I, yeah. I still have this grudge when my uh, motion records were returned from the court because the signature wasn't original, the signature on the affidavit. You know, I still remember that. Yeah. But um, other than that, um, I, I, I really enjoyed talking to you. I really appreciate that you came to this show and talked to our viewers and listeners. Thank you so much, Erin. No problem. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it.